Welcome to Worship Online with St. Paul Lutheran Church of Beloit, Wisconsin. Whether it's Sunday morning and you're worshiping along with others, and if you are, we invite you to say hello and good morning in the chat box, or you're wor worshiping at another time, we are glad that you have joined us today. I have a few announcements. First of all, I wanna highlight where we are in the church year. Next week is Reformation Sunday. And so even though we won't be together, we'll be worshiping online, I invite you to mark the occasion by putting on your red and coming to celebrate together. The week after that, the first weekend in November, the first day in November is All Saints Sunday a very special Sunday in the church year when we honor the saints who have gone before us. At St. Paul, we do that by writing the names of our saints on butterflies and adding them to our butterfly banners. Since we can't be together this year, we will write those names for you if you will send them to us. And we'll also light candles and we'd like to show a picture of each of our saints that we have lost. So if you have lost a beloved one who showed you the way of faith in the last year, would you send us a picture, let us know their name and how to write it on the butterfly, and we will light a candle and honor them on November 1st, All Saints Sunday. In light of that, I wanted to mention that St. Paul lost one of our own last week. Vilas Adams passed away. We are sad that he is no longer with us, glad that he no longer suffers, and hopeful that we will meet again in the day of resurrection. Would you keep all who loved Phylus, particularly his family, in your prayers in these difficult times? I invite you now to quiet your hearts and minds as we prepare for a time of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who redeems, creates, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before even examining ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our sins, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live freed and renewed to do God's work in the world. Amen.
Let us pray. God of servant rule, raise your throne in our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image and for your kingdom. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours, no more nor less than all that we are and all that we have. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This is a reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Most likely, this letter is the first written by Paul. Paul gives pastoral encouragement and reassurances to new Christians living in an antagonistic environment. Their commitment of faith, love, and hope make them a model for other new Christian communities. From Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy to the Thessalonians church that is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to all of you. We always thank God for all of you when we mention you constantly in our prayers. This is because we remember your work that comes from faith, your effort that comes from love, and your perseverance that comes from hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, you are loved by God, and we know that he has chosen you. We know this because our good news didn't come to you just in speech, but also with power and the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know as well as we do what kind of people we were when we were with you, which was for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord when you accepted the message that came from the Holy Spirit with joy, in spite of great suffering. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The message about the Lord rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. The news about your faithfulness to God has spread so that we don't even need to mention it. People tell us about what sort of welcome we had from you and how you turned to God from idols. As a result, you are serving the living and true God, and you are waiting for his son from heaven. His son is Jesus, who is the one he raised from the dead, and who is the one who will rescue us from the coming wrath. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees met together to find a way to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to him. Teacher, they said, we know that you are genuine and that you teach God's way as it really is. We know that you are not swayed by people's opinions because you don't show favoritism. So tell us what you think. Does the law allow people to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Knowing their evil motives, Jesus replied, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me a coin that you use to pay the tax. They brought him a coin. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked. Caesar's, they replied. Then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were astonished and they departed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Simple, right? In today's continuation of Matthew's reality TV hit, Jesus versus the Pharisees, Jesus slips through the ever-tightening net that the religious leaders are building around him by answering a question with a logic quiz. The question, what does belong to the empire, or to anyone for that matter, and what belongs to God? Jesus 
takes the question and flips it around to ask his questioners. They think they've asked him the unanswerable question. If he says it's lawful to pay taxes, he is significantly tarnished in his reputation among the common folk who are oppressed by the taxation of Rome in a very real way. If he says it's not lawful, then they've got something concrete that they can take to the Roman authorities, a reason to have him arrested, perhaps. That's what they're looking for, a way to get him arrested. We may not realize it at first from our 21st century viewpoint, but in terms of on-screen drama, this confrontation is actually very impressive. First and foremost, we have to remember when and where this comes in the story of Jesus' life. Remember, this is the middle of Holy Week, just days before Jesus' trial and execution. And there's good reason to think that Jesus and his confronters are standing in the temple complex. Yesterday, in the biblical timeline, Jesus flipped over the tables of the money changers in the temple courts. Today, he returns to the temple and once again is confronted by the Pharisees and their devotees, demanding to know just who he thinks he is. Who gave you this authority? They want to know. The temple backdrop, as it turns out, is really important for understanding this particular story and the irony that Jesus is pointing out. The Jews had really strict practices and policies about what was and, accept and wasn't acceptable inside the temple. Men and women had different places to pray. Non-Jews, Gentiles, were not even allowed inside the temple itself, only into the outer courtyard. And Another rule of the temple was that only temple coins had value, could be used. So people came from all over the Jewish diaspora with all kinds of coins, but in order to offer a tithe to pay for a sacrifice, they had to change that money into temple coins. Hence the courtyard of money changers where Jesus flips the tables. And within that courtyard, Roman coins would have been particularly troublesome because Roman coins were a mini symbol of the heart of the Jewish Roman problem. Rome managed to absorb a whole variety of different cultures and peoples and their religions under the auspices of the Roman Empire. They did it by tolerating a great deal of diversity of practice and belief. Rome didn't care who you worshipped. It only asked one thing, that in addition to whatever your traditions and beliefs, you also worshipped the emperor, Caesar. For most polytheistic ancient Middle Eastern and European peoples, that wasn't a problem. They could add one more deity to the list, but not for the pesky Jews. For the Jews who stubbornly insisted that they worshiped the one true God, adding worship of anyone or anything else just wasn't an option. And the Roman coins, which bore the image of the emperor and claimed that Caesar was God, were a symbol of that problem between Rome and the Jews. So when Jesus asks the Pharisees to show him a Roman coin, he's highlighting their hypocrisy. The coin is too defiled and defiling to be acceptable within the temple. And yet, the religious leaders have set up a sophisticated banking system in the courtyard of the temple to change that money into acceptable currency for God and then pocket it themselves, making them plenty of profitable gain outside the temple in the wider Roman Empire. 
Jesus' challengers have lost already the moment they produce that coin. Jesus has made a point that wouldn't have been lost on those gathered crowds who were watching. Whatever his authority comes from, the corruption of these religious leaders and their capitulation to the authority, the power of Rome, was crystal clear in that moment. Instead of choosing between the two wrong answers that the leaders offered him, Jesus asks them right back, what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God? Now the problem is theirs. On the surface, it might be easy for us as modern day Americans especially to read Jesus' words and think that what's being advocated for is a clear separation of church and state, religious duty and civic duty. Isn't that what Jesus is saying when he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's? Keep distinct God and government. We might think as the rest of the Roman Empire did in Jesus' day, okay, no big deal. Give God what's due to God, give the emperor what's due to the emperor, end of story. But that's not just missing the point. It's precisely the problem that Jesus, I think, is highlighting. From whose perspective do Jesus' inquisitors answer him? Do we answer that question? Because from Caesar's perspective, taxes and honor and even worship are due Caesar. Not at the exclusion of other loyalties, just in addition to them. But from God's perspective, the whole earth and all that is in it belongs to God. So what is due to Caesar? And what is due to God? The Jewish leaders press Jesus. They say their loyalty belongs to God and they believe they're loyal, but they're also loyal to Rome, loyal enough. That coin is a reminder to everyone standing there. You can't have it both ways. You cannot be loyal to both Caesar and Yahweh. Because if Yahweh is the one true God, you cannot worship Caesar as God also. Let's have a moment of truth-telling ourselves. We too have bought the lie. Even those of us faithfully raised in church and trained in the faith, we have bought the lie that we can have multiple lords that various people and things have rights to parts of our lives and parts of us, and that we have a right to a portion as well. And so we apportion ourselves and our possessions and our time out, and we keep some for ourselves. We divide it all up, our time, our money, our hearts, and give this amount to God, this amount to the man, this amount to that cause that we're passionate about, and this much we keep for ourselves. We think of our lives often as divided in that way, and in doing so, we give ourselves multiple lords, multiple gods. The truth is, God demands of us much more than a tax, more than a tithe, more than a portion of our money, our time, and ourselves. God demands everything. God has the audacity to claim that God is due all of it, everything. Every choice in our lives, every dollar we ever earn or are given, every relationship we enter into, every breath we draw into our lungs. All of it belongs to God. Friends, Christian discipleship is not just taxing. It is all-consuming. As the chair of our stewardship committee likes to say, stewardship 
is everything you do after you say, I believe. Not just a portion, all. So what do we do with the other demands, the other people and things in our lives that we feel rightly a responsibility, a duty towards, that we think we owe something to? Do we not pay our taxes? Do we not vote? Do we not do a thousand other things to fulfill promises to others? Of course not. But we give We pay, we offer allegiance to, we honor all of those things as if we were giving to God. Paul writes in his letter to the Colossian church, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the principle. It's all God's. What you pay whether it's with your time or your money or your energy, you're paying to some God or another. And we can do the right things but pay the wrong God. We can go to church every Sunday but pay it to the God of public opinion. On the other side, we can vote. Sometimes we can even vote for opposing candidates and each of us still be paying allegiance to the one true God, not to any candidate or party or even country, because we do it with hearts dedicated to loving our neighbors, welcoming the stranger, caring for the least of these, seeing God's kingdom come and knowing that only the God of Jesus, not any political party or platform, can accomplish those things. Who are you paying dues to with your life? Who and what other than the one true God lays claim to your loyalties? Your money, your time, your affections, your energy, your body, your promises. Who do you pay them to? And what would change this week, this month, this year, if we remembered and lived every moment as if the only claim on us that mattered is the claim that God has on our lives. Let me leave you with one final thought. Lest we think that our allegiances and our dues are the most important thing, we should take those seriously. We should examine where our hearts and our loyalties lie. But Jesus' words are a powerful reminder of an even greater and even more determinative truth. Whomever and whatever we divide our loyalties among, God's faithfulness is steadfast. And God has laid claim to us. The image stamped on the Roman coin was that of Caesar. The image stamped on us is the image of God's own self. Whether we like it or not, we belong to God. God has claimed us. And in the end, that is the promise that we can rest in. We are stamped with the image of God. God chooses us. Thanks be to God. Yeah.
You are encouraged to share your prayer concerns by typing a name or a few words in the comment box on YouTube or Facebook, or by saying the names out loud. We join together in lifting our prayers to God. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, you call us by name and invite us to share your good news. Send your Holy Spirit among all preachers and evangelists. We pray for bishops, teachers, church leaders, and all children of God as they invite others to your table of boundless grace. Strengthen us especially to share the good news in this difficult time among our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of praise, the heavens and all creation declare your salvation. From the rising of the sun to its setting, may the whole universe show forth your goodness. Raise up devoted stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of truth, you show no partiality. May your spirit guide the work of all judges, lawyers, court officials, and all vocations of the law, that your promise of restoration may be known. God of all, may your word of justice sound forth in every place. Restore divided nations and communities with reconciling truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of light, we pray for those living with pain, illness, isolation, grief, anger, or doubt. We pray especially for all those on our prayer list and those whom we name now. Join their voices in a new song, assuring them that you call them each by name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, as you raised Jesus from the dead, so raise up those who have died in you, especially Vilas Adams. We give thanks for his witness and the witness of all saints who have gone before us, confident of your rescuing welcome for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Take a moment now and share a sign of God's peace. First, with those in the room with you, a hug, a kiss, a handshake, an elbow bump. But also, think of those in your life or your community who need a word of hope, of peace this week, and how you can reach out to them, whether that's a text, a phone call, an email, a card dropped in the mail. Christ, shalom, wholeness, well-being, peace be with you all.
May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign, savior, and spirit be with you today and always. Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.